Good evening and welcome to the live stream broadcast of the evening message from the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. The Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church is located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma, Washington. And uh, you uh, can access uh, the church uh, webpage and get more information about um, the church. We're uh, meeting at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. Um, and for a Sunday school class for all ages, we also have separate class for teens taught by Tyler Brillhart. And uh, then we uh, have our regular morning worship at 10.30 a.m. And both those are live streamed as well. And then we have this evening uh, message, which is only live streamed and not live at the church. I want to welcome uh, Kaylin. Glad to see her this evening. Hi, Kaylin. And uh, good to have uh, Pam Zangi with us. Congratulations, Pam. And uh, welcome to you to the evening broadcast tonight. Pam was married on Friday and uh, really uh, thankful for uh, the Lord's blessing in, in that regard for her. And it's nice to see you too, Sue. It's uh, good to have you back uh, with us. And uh, pray the Lord will bless you as you fellowship with us tonight. We also have, of course, uh, small groups that meet during the week. Um, and uh, they'll be meeting, of course, up probably until a uh, week before Christmas or so. Um, so if you're interested in one of those small groups, you could contact uh, the church office and we'll be happy to direct you to one near you or one that might fit you best, give you an opportunity to get to know people in the church. If you're just tuning in now and your intention is to go ahead and move towards the message, if you move about 10 minutes ahead uh, in uh, this uh, live stream broadcast, you'll, you'll come to... Um, the message time. That is if you're listening to this at a different time. If you're live with us now, it's uh, going to be about 10 minutes before we begin the message. Um, good to see Deacon Peters and Elder Welch with us tonight. Welcome to you, gentlemen. Good to have you on board as well. Deacon Peters uh, works to keep us online in the mornings and uh, live streaming in our Sunday school hour and our morning worship hour and appreciate all that he puts into that. Um, we have a wonderful media committee now. Pam's on that as well as George and uh, it's really uh, helped to have uh, you folks available and uh, thank you for all you do to make that possible. <coughs> Pardon me. This is the live stream of the evening message from the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. This is the live stream Evening message from the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. The Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church is located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma, Washington. And we have regular services on the Lord's Day, um, beginning at 9.30 a.m. with our Sunday School. And uh, that is live streamed uh, on YouTube as well as our morning worship service at 10.30 a.m. And then, at least for the time being, we have uh, just our evening service. Uh, really just a message here uh, from uh, my home. Uh, and someday we'll be hopefully getting back uh, to the church. We're anxious to do that and uh, looking forward to it. I hope that will come soon. <coughs> Pardon me again. If you're watching this broadcast at uh, another time, other than when it's being live streamed, you can move ahead probably about 
uh, seven, eight minutes ahead, and you should come to the actual uh, message itself. We were blessed to be able to help out some families over Thanksgiving uh, by uh, supplying food and uh, needs for them, and that was a blessing to be able to do, and uh, we thank the Lord for that opportunity in conjunction with uh, uh, our Gray Middle School, uh, which is across the street from our church in Manitou Elementary, and uh, we're thankful that we had the opportunity to do that and appreciate the leadership there of uh, Tyler and helping to coordinate it, and then, of course, um, those who helped to uh, also uh, distribute um, those uh, goodies. Welcome to the Marcellias. Um, thankful to have you with us tonight, and uh, we praise God for this opportunity, too, to, to be able to meet together on Sunday evening and just to uh, take a little time to look into God's Word. Appreciate it when folks sign in. Uh, gives us a, a good connection and we can uh, know you're watching and we're thankful for all of those who do so. We know not everyone does and we want to welcome those who don't as well, but uh, appreciate the the messages and the exchange of greetings that goes on in our uh, comment uh, line as well. We're just about five or six minutes from our start time this evening. Good to see Dr. Battle uh, signing in now, and uh, good to have him with us. It was uh, a blessing to be together this morning and uh, to uh, share in the Lord's Supper, and um, we look to feeding on the Lord's Word tonight. This is the live stream evening message from the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. Church is located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma, Washington. This is the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. If you're watching this at another time and you skip ahead about five minutes, you will be uh, where we are at uh, the time we begin our actual message this evening. Good to see David and Linda here. Um, good to have your fellowship online. We miss you, but uh, we're glad that we can be together this way. And uh, I'm so thankful that uh, the message this morning was a blessing. And uh, thankful that we can have you with us this evening. Good evening, this is the live evening broadcast from the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. Welcome uh, to this broadcast. We'll be having our evening message here shortly. See the Andersons have joined us now. Greetings to the Andersons. It's good to see uh, so many folks uh, signed on tonight. Looking forward to 
our fellowship together in the word. See that uh, the Fries have joined in. Good evening to Aaron, Kelsey, and all. Glad to have you with us tonight. Um, always a, a blessing to see folks signing on and joining in with us. We'll be starting here in just a few minutes now. Um, the clock says 6 o'clock. But we will uh, wait just a minute or two to give a few more folks an opportunity uh, to sign on with us. And then we'll begin. This is the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. And this is our evening message live streamed here on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, we welcome you and uh, pray that the Lord will bless us tonight as we meet together in his name. No, wait uh, one more minute and then uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started tonight. Um, just uh, delaying a minute here or two for people to have an opportunity to sign on and uh, be with us for the opening of the message tonight. This is the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. Glad to see the Davises uh, with us now, too. Welcome to uh, you all. I uh, hope you're continuing to do well. Good to have the floods uh, with us tonight. And I uh, see they've uh, signed on as well. I have a good group tonight. We'll look forward to spending time together in God's Word talking about revival, the revival under Hezekiah. Uh, that the Lord uh, brought forward and uh, talk about it in the context of our own times as well. So we're ready to begin. Um, just give us uh, another minute or so and then we'll, we'll start off. The Tacoma Bio Presbyterian Church is located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma, Washington. We meet on the Lord's Day, beginning at 9.30 a.m. for a Sunday school class for all ages. We do have one a separate class for the teens, and uh, that's taught by uh, assistant to the pastor, Tyler Brillhart, and we appreciate Tyler's efforts in that regard, teaching the teens. But everybody else, uh, children and parents, meet together, and adults uh, in the main sanctuary of the church, and that uh, Sunday school lesson is uh, live streamed as well. And then at 10.30 a.m., we have our morning worship, and it, too, is made available on live stream. Or, of course, you can go back and look at past uh, um, messages. You can do that by going to our YouTube channel, and you'll find there uh, a long collection of messages, uh, some of them part of a series, some of them individual messages, but you'll see them all there. We also have small groups that meet during the week. Uh, throughout the week and if you contact the church if you're interested in one of those small groups we'll be happy to line you up with one. Meanwhile I think uh, we're ready to go ahead and get started tonight. So good evening grace mercy and peace to you from God the Father and from his son the Lord Jesus Christ. We're Glad to have you with us tonight, and we pray the Lord's blessing as uh, we look together at uh, his word this evening. Uh, what calls us together to study the word of God and to glorify God? Well, it's God's word itself. And so we turn tonight to Psalm 28, verses 6 through 7, and we read this. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song, I will praise him. Now, I'm not going to sing for you tonight, obviously, but uh, our hearts do sing uh, in praise to the Lord. And let's lift them now together in prayer to him. Father in heaven, we come now in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we come, Lord, seeking your blessing on our time together in your word this evening. We thank you, Lord, those of us who were able to be together this morning for the fellowship that we had in your house and for the blessing of your 
uh, of participating in the Lord's Supper, and Lord, for the opportunity to think about your uh, extraordinary love for us through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray now tonight that you will open our hearts to your word, that you'll look upon us as your sheep and feed us. And Lord, we pray that uh, you'd open our hearts to receive the word with gladness. We thank you, Father, for uh, this time together. And we now, Lord, ask you to look on us where we are in our homes and, Lord, to extend to us your blessing as one people. Though we're separated by distance tonight, uh, may we be joined together as one people by your word and your spirit. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to be reading for our scripture tonight from two different places. First of all, from Leviticus chapter 4, verses 22 through 26, and then we're going to go to 2 Chronicles 29. So first of all, uh, Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus 4, and moving down that chapter to verse 22, and we're going to read verses 22 through 26. This section has to do with uh, making um, uh, sacrifices for sin under the law of Moses. And it's interesting because verse 26 begins, or rather verse 22 begins, by telling us that this is the prescription for rulers and for offenses that come from them. So Leviticus chapter 4, verse 22. When a ruler has sinned and done something unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord his God in anything which should not be done and is guilty, or if his sin which he has committed comes to his knowledge, he shall bring as his offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the goat and kill it at the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and pour its blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering. And he shall burn all its fat on the altar, like the fat of the sacrifice of the peace offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. We go from here, from Leviticus chapter 4, to Second Chronicles chapter 29. And now, many years after Moses, we have this king, King Hezekiah, the king of Judah. And we read this. Then King Hezekiah, I'm sorry, this is Second Chronicles 29, verse 20. We're moving down that chapter, uh, of a chapter, 29th chapter of Second Chronicles, down to verse 20. Then King Hezekiah rose early, gathered the rulers of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom, for the sanctuary, and for Judah. Then he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So they killed the bulls, and the priests received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, they killed the rams and sprinkled the blood on the altar. They also killed the lambs and sprinkled the blood on the altar. Then they brought out the male goats for the sin offering before the king and the assembly, and they laid their hands on them. And the priests killed them, and they presented their blood on the altar as a sin offering to make an atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering be made for all Israel. May the Lord bless our reading tonight from his holy and his inerrant word. And let's just pray now once more and ask his blessing on the word itself. Father, these are things that happened long ago. And yet, Lord, they are pertinent to our own times. We are dependent upon you, Lord, to make that connection for us. And so we come in Christ's name, asking you, Lord, to help us to understand what's going on here, and then, Lord, helping us or causing us to apply it to our own hearts as is needed. 
for correction, for encouragement, for strengthening, for whatever is required as you know the state of our hearts. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's hard to imagine the state of things in Judah when King Hezekiah takes the throne. We've been talking about it, but as much as we do, it's still not something I think that comes easily to mind for us. To think of the holy precincts of the temple of Jehovah in Jerusalem, shut up and abandoned, being used as a mere storage shed for debris and disused items. It's a heartbreaking to think of the temple in that state. To imagine this room and the Holy of Holies beyond it, dusty, dirty, and, and deserted, seems so strange. But when other things begin to occupy the minds and hearts of the people of Judah and their king, this was the inevitable result. They found the often lewd worship of the Canaanite idols more to the taste of their flesh, and the superstitious and elaborate ceremonies of other cultures more satisfying to their proud and sinful nature. It's true, beloved, that if God does not preserve a remnant to himself in any and every generation, it would not be long before the whole world would be in darkness and all the churches in it would be abandoned. It's God who keeps that from happening, not man. In Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22, we read, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. Now, yes, God uses men to, to, to do that work, but it's his work in them. We have Luther because we have a compassionate God. We have Calvin because we have a compassionate God. And there are lots of other examples that we could bring forward. So our God does preserve men and women to himself, even in the darkest times. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 31, the prophecy of Joel chapter 2 and verse 31, the Lord says this to his prophet, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. And so, coming in the line of King David, born to a, a godless king who didn't know David's heart and therefore didn't know David's God, is this 25-year-old son who now becomes king named Hezekiah. And we find that Hezekiah has a heart after David's heart. And he, with faith and boldness, begins restoring the true worship of God in Jerusalem, Judea. And he even has a heart for the northern kingdom. And we'll come back to that in a moment. For 16 days, the priests and Levites labor in the temple and trying to get it back into order and ceremonially cleansed so that sacrifices and worship can resume in Jerusalem. John Trapp, who you know I love to quote from time to time, he points out it's a testimony to just how quickly sin can defile what is holy when we take stock of the fact that King Ahaz was able to so ruin the work of the temple and cause so much trash and disruption during his short reign, that it took 16 days to clean it up for a whole group of the Levites and the priests so that the temple could be used again. Nevertheless, when all that work is done, we read this in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 18. Then they, that's the Levites and the priests who were doing that cleaning work, went in to King Hezekiah and said, 
We have cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar of burnt offerings, with all its articles, and the table of the showbread with all its articles. Moreover, all the articles which King Ahaz in his reign had cast aside in his transgression, we have prepared and sanctified. And there they are before the altar of the Lord. And Hezekiah rose early, gathered the rulers of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord. And then they bring the sacrifices that we read about a moment ago. So the first thing to notice here is the thoroughness of their work. That is the work of the Levites and the priests. And I put the Levites first because you remember we've already taken notice of the fact that the Levites um, were actually more ready in this matter than uh, the, the priests were. And we continue to see the reluctance of the priests as we go through this together. But note first the thoroughness of their work. So Second Chronicles 29, 18. Then they went into King Hezekiah and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord. Uh, so the whole house was cleansed, all the altar of burnt offerings, and all its articles, and the table of showbread with all its articles. And there are several things to take note of here. First, this work that they've done, the completeness of this work, is a reflection on them as the servants of the Lord. They replaced their neglect of the things of God with diligence in the service of the Lord. And that's a sure sign of the work of the Lord among them. Um, the prophet Samuel encouraged the people by assuring them in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 22, 1 Samuel 12, 22, the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. He makes men and women his people, and then he equips them to do every good work. And he took these Levites and he strengthened them, and he encouraged them, and they led the work of restoration here. And so it's a reflection on them that they were being employed by the Lord, and they, they went to their work, and they did it quickly, and they did it thoroughly. Secondly, it's a reflection on King Hezekiah. Obviously, though he was a young man, he clearly was taken seriously, indicating that he held them to their task by his authority and the way he conducted himself. Even though he was, for all intents and purposes, a youth among them, um, he still had their respect, and he demanded that respect. And he required them to do what he told them to do. When he gave the instructions that they should clean the temple and get these things in order, um, he did it with a, with a sense of gravity that made it clear that he meant what he said, and that even though he was a young man, uh, he was not going to entertain any uh, slowness or reluctance on the part of the Levites or the priests. In Proverbs 20 and verse 8, we're told, A king who sits on the throne of judgment scatters all evil with his eyes. And uh, Hezekiah seems to be that sort of king. Matthew Henry says, They knew the good king had set his heart upon God's altar and longed to be attending that. And therefore... They insisted most upon the readiness they had put that into, that the vessels for the altar were scoured and brightened, and all was ready for the king. Thirdly, it's a reflection, above all, on God himself, both as to what he requires and to how he equips his servants to serve. First of all, as to what he requires, in Leviticus 22, the book of Leviticus, chapter 22, verse 32, the Lord says, You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And uh, the fact that all of this had to be done, the temple cleansed and put in proper order before it could be used, was a testimony to the holiness of God himself. In Psalm 110, Psalm 110 Verse 3, 
we read, Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. And so here we're told that in the days of power, that uh, the people of God will be volunteers. And of course, that's a picture of what was to come under Christ uh, as the king and uh, as our high priest. But it's pictured here as well, that he, the Lord is ready to work through Hezekiah. And so he also works in the hearts of the people. You and I, beloved, serve the same God who's not changed in his demand to be sanctified and all who draw near him. And your king, the Lord Jesus Christ, urges you and me to forsake the world and to serve him, to purge out the old leaven, as it were. First Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sanctified for us. So we've been redeemed and we're called on by Christ to serve him. Next comes the report to uh, Hezekiah. So we've talked now about the work that was done and how it was complete and thorough. Now we come to the word they bring to Hezekiah himself, that's now in Second Chronicles 29, verse 19. They said, Moreover, all the articles which King Ahaz in his reign had cast aside in his transgression, we have prepared and sanctified, and there they are before the altar of the Lord. And that's their way of saying, here it all is, we're ready to go. We're ready to start sacrificing. We're ready to reinstitute the worship of God. And the first thing we want to note here is the stark contrast and attitude between King Ahaz and his son, King Hezekiah. King Ahaz cast aside those articles set aside for the service of God. That was an overt act of transgression. The other, King Hezekiah, ordered and saw to their being prepared and sanctified for holy use before the Lord. Ahaz took the power and authority granted to him by God, and he used it to insult the very one who empowered him. He was on the throne by the hand of God, and he, he took then that authority and that power, and he used it uh, to shame and mock the living God who had given him that position. Hezekiah took his authority and his power, and he used it in commanding that the Lord be reverenced. He very quickly turned all of this around. And this is a classic illustration of what Paul says in Romans chapter 13 about rulers. He says in Romans 13, 3 this, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And when a king is doing what he's called on to do, or any leader in any nation, he is being a terror to evil, and he is encouraging good works. Ahaz, by his despotic opposition to the true faith and his sad addiction to every false way, made himself and his administration a terror to good works, a terror to everything that had to do with, with God and with God's service. He became not God's minister for good, but he became Satan's slave for evil. By raising up his son, King Hezekiah, the Lord returned things to their proper order. And now the power and authority in Jerusalem is there to do good, to encourage what is good, to encourage what is right, and to be a terror to what is wicked. So 
the order of things has been restored here by God by raising up this king. Now in verse 20, we read this. Then Hezekiah rose up early, gathered the rulers of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom, for the sanctuary, and for Judah. Then he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. We note first here that as soon as Hezekiah hears that everything is ready, and you remember what the Levites said? They said it's all there, ready to be used. As soon as he hears that it's all ready, he is ready to act. And he rises early in the morning. He gathers all the elders of the city, accumulates the proper sacrifices, and presents himself to the priests. In short, Hezekiah is quick and thorough. He, first of all, rises early. And by this behavior, Hezekiah follows the advice of his great forebear, Solomon. Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9 and verse 10, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So Hezekiah's hand had found this uh, call to serve the Lord, and the advice of Solomon was do it with all your might. And we find him up early, gathering everybody together and coming. He's also following the counsel of the prophet Jeremiah who in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13, Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, when you're diligent. King Hezekiah demonstrates a zeal in these matters by his quick attention to them. He's not just going to have all this work done and then become distracted by some other uh, responsibility as king. No, this is what he's been waiting for. And he rises early and he gets to it. And here again, we see a characteristic of true revival. There is first a tenderness of conscience and then a heart coupled with a response to God's word. So there's a tenderness of conscience and heart, and that is coupled together with a response, a quick response to God's word. And when revival is uh, in effect, when God is reviving his people, he gives them that tenderness of heart, and he also gives them uh, that quickness of response to his word. Then you notice that Hezekiah engages all who are under his influence. He doesn't just go down to the temple himself with the animals and so on and present them for sacrifice. He makes all the elders get up early and come along with him. And so there's this procession through the streets of Jerusalem as, as the elders come on and they gather, they, they come, become a part of this group, all heading up to the temple. He gathers all the chief men of the city and he brings them along with him. Some of these men had surely been complicit in his father's sin, that is, Ahaz's sin. And they are now required to make public their repentance, even as they had made public their sin. Some of these men very probably had led the people away from Jehovah. And now Hezekiah is requiring them as elders to lead the people back to Jehovah. Of course, others who are in Jerusalem, who would have been faithful through all the apostasy of Ahaz and the others, they would be heartened to see the work of restoration completed and the return of prayer and sacrifice and, and the worship of Jehovah in the temple. A procession like this moving through the streets in the name of God would have filled many hearts with joy, I'm sure. In Psalm 122, 122, David says this. It's a song of ascents. David says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. 
Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Revival, beloved, is on one hand a very private thing. That is, it takes part, takes place in the hearts and the minds of individual believers. But on the other hand, the joy and the peace and the encouragement and even the conviction that it brings naturally reaches out to others so that they may join in. And Hezekiah is not content for this to be just a part of his life. He wants to see the other elders involved. He wants to see all of the people coming and being a part of this. One of the marks of the Great Awakening, which was the, the great revival here in colonial America, was the passion and the burden that those touched by God's word and spirit had for both those who remained untouched, or that is unsaved, and uh, those who were not revived, but were professing believers and were Christians, but weren't going through that, that aspect of revival that drew them closer to the Lord. One pastor reported this. He said, Our public assemblies were then beautiful, and all the congregation was alive in God's service, everyone earnestly intent on the public worship. The assembly in general were from time to time in tears while the word was preached, some weeping with sorrow and distress, those who were under conviction, others with joy and love, those who had been under conviction but had found peace in Jesus Christ, and then the third category, others with pity and concern for the souls of their neighbors. And so we're being told here that during this time of great revival, there, there were those who were dealing with their own sins. There were those who had found great peace in Jesus Christ and, and had truly been revived. But among those who had been truly revived, there, there was a weeping for the souls of others. We see Hezekiah here with a burden not only for himself, but for others. And then he brings to the sacrifice what is required. He's anxious to restore the sacrifices and the worship of God, but he doesn't seek any shortcuts. He's ready to fully acknowledge his sin and the sin of the people by offering the sacrifices made necessary by God's law and God's holiness and their offenses. Now, people today who try to shortcut the gospel, they don't want to deal with sin. They don't want to talk about sin. They don't want to preach anything about sin. They don't want to see people convicted. They don't want to bring forward the sacrifice, that is, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary for sin. They just want to get right to everybody feeling better and everybody praising God. But you can't shortcut these things. And Hezekiah doesn't attempt to do it. He brings the sacrifices that are necessary, made necessary by God's law, by the character of God and his holiness and and by their sin in offending that holiness and that law. Matthew Henry says, Atonement must be made for the sins of the last reign, that is, under the reign of Ahaz. They thought it not enough to lament and forsake those sins, but they brought a sin offering. In other words, they didn't just look back and say, weren't they terrible? And wasn't that an awful thing for my father to do? He brought a sin offering saying this sin is our sin too and we need to repent of it and make atonement for it it's the same for you and me beloved repentance and reformation are vital but they don't serve to gain pardon that can only be had by sacrifice through christ and it's only by our trust and confidence in him as our one-time sacrifice on the cross of Calvary 
that we can find the forgiveness for our sins. So in Hebrews, you read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, or sanctifies for ceremonial purposes, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Then you notice that Hezekiah is concerned for the kingdom first. He has the elders come with him, and you see the sacrifices that he's bringing. He's bringing sacrifices for the kingdom, for the sanctuary, and for Judah. That is, says Matthew Henry, to make atonement for the sins of the princes, he and his father, the priests, who had been in cahoots, with his father, and the people who had not resisted or opposed, but were even relieved by those sins. For they had all, says Matthew Henry, corrupted their way. Now, the numbers brought exceed those warranted by the law, but these are extraordinary times. The sin against Jehovah has not been that which any given year in any given year, dedicated service might have brought forth. Um, that is, if they were just committed to the Lord and were trying to love and serve the Lord, they would still be offending him because in many things we offend God, all of us. So they would still make a, a, be guilty of offenses before the Lord and would need sacri a sacrifice because of those just offenses that come even when they were trying to do their best. But in this case, there have been years of deliberate, defiant, and willful sin with no atonement made during that whole period. Those of you who are with us in Sunday school this morning, you'll remember that in Paul's prayer for the Philippians, he was praying that they would have the knowledge and discernment to approve what was excellent and acceptable in God's eyes so that they might be inoffensive in their walk before the Lord. Um, even the most devout believer is liable to stumble. But the offensive, or the offenses, are not designed and pursued as a deliberate course. Hezekiah, he sought that sort of life, but his father did not. Ahaz was a deliberate apostate sinner. Now, seven each of these sacrifices seems to reflect the idea that seven is the perfect number for the Jew. And in this situation, how could they ever, how could they ever bring a sufficient number of sacrifices for the transgressions of Ahaz, the priests, and the people? It just was impossible. That they could never do it that they had to already begin making sacrifices for their own sins, for, for that of the, the sins of that very day and that very hour, how could they possibly bring enough to work all the way back during those 16 years of Ahaz and the priests and the people offending God? The best that they could do was something representative and pray that the Lord in his mercy would accept it. And the perfect number seemed to be the best fit under those circumstances. And so seven of each one Hezekiah brings. How thankful we are tonight that you and me, living in the age of grace, have had a perfect and complete sacrifice made for us by the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, for all our sins. When we see this sacrificial system, it's meant to be a school teacher to point us to Christ. And it does. How could they ever atone for all the sins, just even ceremonial, cer ceremonially, of King Ahaz and the priests and the people? Think of these priests. They're, they're, they're dedicated to the service of Jehovah. They're in the line of Aaron 
And look what they've done. They, they've brought in pagan altars and they've sacrificed to idols. How could any atonement ever be made sufficient for that sin and for years of that sort of sin? It couldn't be. Could never be. Not even to cleanse them ceremonially. And yet here we are, completely cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We believe that our sevenfold manifold sins shall be taken away by that perfect and absolute sacrifice of the Messiah, that lamb without blemish and without spot, says Trap. And finally, you notice that he orders the priests to do their duty. And this is where it's hinted at, once again, that they're a little bit reluctant or they're exercising some passive resistance to these reforms and to the restoration of the worship of Jehovah. He brings the sacrifices and says, now do it, do it. And so we read in verse 22, they killed the bulls and the priests received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, they killed the rams and did the same with the blood there, the lambs, and did the same. And then they brought out the male goats for the sin offering before the king and the assembly, and they laid their hands on them. It's so easy to just kind of look away from this scene. But it's a scene of death and the shedding of blood. It was the sight of these animals being butchered and sacrificed that was intended to demonstrate the exceeding wickedness of sin. And I know for some of your children listening, it's maybe a difficult thing for you to picture these animals being put to death in this way. But the picture that God was setting before his people was the exceeding sinfulness of sin. The blood was liberally sprinkled on the altar and poured around the altar. Not lightly, lightly like we might suspect from the word sprinkle, but it's liberally uh, spread around all over that altar. And it was necessary because of how much they had defiled themse themselves by their sin. It was intended to prefigure or typify or picture, we should say, the cleansing of our conscience through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. But how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience, Hebrews chapter 9 says. It, this manner of sacrifice was done to typify the pacifying of God's wrath against the sinner. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Romans 5, 9, Paul says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So it typifies or shows or pictures the pacifying of God's wrath against the sinner. It was also a picture of the work of Christ in purchasing the church with his own blood washing it in his own blood. And it was a picture of the opening of the Holy of Holies to you and me. That is the opening uh, to the very presence of God for you and me. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews 10 and verse 19, we read, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now the last step was for the elders with the king to acknowledge their own guilt by laying their hands on the head of the sacrifice. But it's more than confessing guilt. It's also an expression of desire to see the sin, its defilement, and its guilt carried away. 
They would lay their hands on the head of that goat, transferring the guilt of that sin to the head of the goat, and then to see that carried away through the death of that animal. That was, of all things, a picture of Christ. And we look to him as the one who, through his sacrifice for us, carried the guilt and the consequences of our sins away from us. And then they made burnt offerings, and those burnt offerings were designed to give glory to God, to show that all of this was proper and right and good, because it was what God commanded, and it befit God's holiness, that they should repent and make sacrifices for their sins committed during the days of King Ahaz. Then in verse 24, we read that the priests killed them and they presented their blood that is of the goats on the altar as a sin offering to make an atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering be made for all Israel. Now, what you see here, beloved, is a generous act on the part of King Hezekiah. The northern kingdom had hounded Judah, the kingdom of Judah. So remember Israel, or the nation of Israel was divided into two. Uh, after the days of Solomon, there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah and what was called the kingdom of Israel. That kingdom of Israel has already been destroyed and carried off uh, um, because of their sins. But when Hezekiah reinstates this worship, he insists that it be a sacrifice for all Jews even for those of the northern kingdom, that perhaps the Lord would show them some mercy because of this sacrifice in the face of their, their sin. And the northern kingdom had hounded Hezekiah's father Ahaz, and it was very close to carrying off all the women and children of the kingdom of Judah and making them slaves. If you go back to chapter 28 and verse 8, you read, and the children of Israel, that is the northern kingdom, carried away captive of their brethren from Judah, 200,000 women, sons, and daughters. And they also took away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria, the capital of that northern kingdom. Now, the Lord intervened by sending the prophet Oded to, to warn the soldiers of, of Israel to let the wives and the children of Israel go, or rather of Judah go. But it was only done with reluctance. There was real animosity at this point between the children of Israel and, the, and the, those of the kingdom of Judah. And yet here you find Hezekiah saying, let's go in, let's make atonement for our sins, and I want it done for all of Israel, for all of the Jews, northern kingdom and southern kingdom, in hopes that the Lord will show mercy. He's eager to offer a sacrifice on the behalf of those who have really been his enemies. And in that, Hezekiah is seeking reconciliation. He is offering atonement. He's seeking the restoration of the worship of God for all the kingdom of David. He's not content that they should only be concerned with themselves and Judah, but that all God's people repent and acknowledge their sins. Trapp says, It is but a little fire that casts but a little heat. A great fire will be felt afar off. So a great measure of charity. That is by doing this and showing this sort of love, It'll send a message all the way up into uh, Israel. And that brings us to the lessons we have here on the nature of revival. And I'm just going to share them with you quickly. First of all, as we look at what we've seen tonight, we know that revival produces alacrity or zeal in spiritual duties. Uh, we see that here, of course, in Hezekiah. In Hosea chapter 14, Hosea 14.4, 14, we read this. I will heal, heal their backsliding, the Lord says. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. And I will be like the dew to Israel, 
He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread, his beauty shall be like an olive tree, and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return, they shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine, their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. All that pictures the zeal that comes with revival from the hand of the Lord. Secondly, it engenders, or that is, it spawns confession of sin. When real revival comes down from the Lord, sinners repent, and they confess their sins. In Nehemiah chapter 9, this is the book of Nehemiah chapter 9, there's a revival going on there under Nehemiah and Ezra. And we read this, Now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of their God for one-fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. So true revival engenders or spawns confession of sin. Thirdly, it emboldens faith in God's word. This is Psalm 138, verses 2 and 3. Psalm 138. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. I was in danger. I cried out to you. And Lord, you made me bold and strong. And lastly, True revival encourages love towards God and others. One of the men who witnessed the impact of the Great Awakening in his congregation reported this. Many have spoken much of their hearts being drawn out in love to God and Christ and their minds being wrapped up in delightful contemplation of the glory and the wonderful grace of God and the excellency and dying love of Jesus Christ, and their souls going forth in longing desires after God and Christ. There's the evidence of, of this encouragement of love towards God and, and towards others. Abigail Hutchison, her story is unique in its particulars, but it's common in its effects in regards to revival. She was wonderfully saved during the days of the Great Awakening, which was a time of powerful spiritual revival here in colonial America. And I'll not go into the details of her conversion, but almost immediately this woman was changed in a way that she had a blessed and deep abiding love for others. It wasn't part of her character before her redemption, but during this revival, when she was brought to Christ, her heart was changed in that regard. And she spoke of this love and she acted on it, not just directly, but even indirectly. And let me share with you one of its most profound manifestations in her life. This love was so real and so influential in her life that she not only loved God, but she loved God's people in a dramatic way. When a new convert entered the shop where she was working with her family, she could hardly be restrained for joy. She was overcome with love and joy, love to God, love for this new believer, and the joy of seeing what God had done in her life. She was so glad to see them, to know that they were now in Christ, so filled with love that it was obvious. One day, three new believers walked into her shop and were told, seeing them as they stepped in one after another into the door, so affected her and so drew forth her love to them that it overcame her and she almost fainted. And when they began to talk of the things of faith or religion, it was more than she could bear. They were obliged to cease 
on the account of how it was affecting this woman. It was a very frequent thing with her to be overcome with a flow of affection to them. And she thought godly, uh, uh, and as she thought godly in conversation with them. And though she wanted to talk about those things, sometimes she just couldn't because it was too overwhelming to her. And sometimes it wasn't even in conversation. It was just seeing a fellow believer, seeing a new convert. It just drew such love out of her for God and for them that she was overcome by it. And remember, this was not her character. This was not the way she was. She wasn't a dramatic and, and overt woman who, who sort of gushed over everything before her own salvation. And this is afterwards, when the Spirit of God is filling her with love for the brethren. Hezekiah has that kind of love. He's concerned not only for himself, for his priests, for his own kingdom, but even for the people of the north, even though they are, for all intents and purposes, his enemies at this point. He's concerned for them because they've been carried away by their sins. And so he makes the sacrifice not only for himself and for his people, but for them too. May God give us these marks of revival in our lives. And may we have that kind of love for him, for one another, for new believers, and for the lost. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time together, again, looking at Hezekiah and the revival that took place in his days. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you work in the hearts of believers. And we ask you, Lord, to work in our hearts. If there's anyone listening to this who is without hope in Christ, we pray, Lord, that tonight or when they're listening, they will come face to face with the reality of their own sin and uh, the fact that they can make no sacrifice and they can make no amends themselves for those sins. That the one sacrifice for sinners is Jesus Christ, who gave his life on the cross of Calvary, that through his shed blood, we might be forgiven all of our sin. And though that doesn't sound reasonable to carnal reason, we thank you, Lord, that it is the gospel brought to us by Christ himself. That you so love the world that you sent your only begotten son into the world, that we might not perish, but that through him we might have everlasting life. For all of us, Lord, who are yours, we pray for that reviving spirit that will fill us with greater love for you and greater love for others. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Good night. Oops. <laughs>